another episode of the Silicon Dreams. We are on Radio Zindagi, 15.50 a.m. And joining me in the studio today for another episode of the Silicon Dreams where we are going to talk about Web3 investment trends for 2023 and beyond. I have guest VCs, Miko from Gummy Crypto Capitals and we have Manmeet from Punja VC. Now, without further ado, I'm going to go over to our fun guest. We're going to have amazing conversations today, guys, and you're going to hear all about NFTs, Metaverse, and how all of that is being further augmented, and especially with Apple dropping its big news today. Let's jump into it. I'm going to first go to Miko. Hey, Miko, welcome to the Silicon Dreams. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience here? Yes, hello. I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually a venture capitalist here in Silicon Valley. I've been here about 30 years. So, like, I've been here a while. You know, I've only been doing venture capital investing over the past five or six years, and I've really only focused on Web3 and cryptocurrencies, this type of asset class. So it's really very focused. That's the business I've been in, and I'm definitely very excited about the Apple announcement that Sonia mentioned. So it's really exciting to see the emergence of a true metaverse driven by a tech leader like Apple. So, you know, I just want to talk about like the future. So hi guys, uh, my name is Menmeet Singh. I have been in the Valley for 30 years, same as Miko, but I got to know Miko only about a month back. <laughs> so before I uh, got into the fund VC business about a year and a half back, but before that, I was an entrepreneur myself. I have started two companies, sold both of them. Uh, one was in security and compliance, and the other one uh, in consulting, and both were differently bought over. One was Thompson Street Partner. But recently got into this fund where we are investing in Web3, AI, where our focus is enterprise. It's a little different than consumer focus. We focus more where real problems are being solved, and that's what we look at. All right. Well, guys, again, you know, we're going to have some amazing conversations for the next 50 minutes where we'll be focusing on Web3 investment trends. So while we are on that topic, Miko, we started our conversations with Apple's VR announcement, right? And I feel like you have, might actually have more to add to the subject. You have invested in metaverses. What do you think? You know, first of all, I would love for you to talk about your metaverse investments and then what do you think this new announcement from apple in terms of the apple pro vr headset that dropped off today what would that mean for the industry yes it's very exciting so of course we've been involved mostly through this sort of web 3 things like nft non-fungible tokens so you know really about the emergence of permanent digital objects so these objects that live actually on the internet itself right which i think is a first so that's a very exciting thing in the past digital objects would sit inside of like proprietary company databases right not on the internet itself natively so we invested in OpenSea, and you know we just think it's very exciting about this kind of emergence of this really great uh kind of futuristic state of the internet which is called the metaverse all right and but Manmeet, I have a question for you, right? Would you talk about one of the recent investments you've made? Because Pancha VC was launched as a fund just last year. If you want to share some details about what Pancha VC's focus is, and then talk about one of the recent Web3 investments you made, especially from an enterprise perspective and the use case itself, that would be great. So, m uh, good question on this, Sonia. But many companies have come, come across in the last six months, which I've been looking at, and I do look at companies which are focused on AI, so market and market size, hype cycle and all that, they're very important. The recent from, uh, thing I made, the recent investment, most recent one was in the company which is looking at fake reviews, audio, video, the campaign reviews is becoming very big. Is it chat GPT generated? Is it AI generated? Or is it human made? So all those things are becoming a big, big issue. Tomorrow somebody comes in in the video. So we invested in a company. It used to be called Tested Web. Now it's called Polygraph.ai. The reason we invested in that was that I think this market is going to evolve. All enterprises, law, law enforcement, FBI, CIA would need. Is this real? Is this fake? Audios, videos. So that's where how AI could be against you or AI could help you also. So that's where uh, I think, and everything is recorded. These guys are recording everything on blockchain. So it's an immutable record. If it's truth, it'll be there. If it's false, it'll be there. So that's the current investment I made in. 
Thank you, Manmeet. One of the questions I would like to ask you is a lot of the people in the audience, right? People understand artificial intelligence because it has been around for a while. So we talk about deep fake and obviously the deep fake is a big threat to the society because there are people who are literate who are still vulnerable to it. And imagine those who aren't as literate. It's so easy to fool them. So people, I feel like people understand the application of AI in this field, but a lot of the times people struggle to understand the application of Web3. Because when it comes to Web3, people just imagine that, okay, you know, Web3, it's either cryptocurrencies, which either people are very bullish on or they're bearish on, and there are many who are like, oh, I don't want to touch it with a yardstick. Or they think about concepts like metaverse and with Facebook, easily like it just pivoting from the metaverse everyone's like is the metaverse even really coming so what i would love for you to talk about is just share a little more insight into how the blockchain piece is being leveraged and why even build on the blockchain for this particular use case see you you, you pretty much mentioned all hype technology in the in the in the conversation right now you brought up ai you brought up web3 you brought up uh, blockchain you brought up deep fake you brought up many many things all these the decentralization the blockchain is very important because ai could mean different thing to you and could mean different thing to us and with the same ai i could show a different video to you and the same video with different concept and different accent to him because he's more interested in a republican campaign or you are more interested in a democrat campaign so i may focus on a different way so this is where a blockchain becomes very important because it tells you this is right or wrong and all that decentralized check can happen on an open public forum. And that's where I think things will be moving to, things will be recording. So it's a marriage, it's a marriage happening. I know it's a very early days. People talked about blockchain just two years, three years back and crypto was big. And then everybody talked about NFT, that was big. Then people started talking about AI. AI has been talked about for years, but now this generative AI is creating a new issue. It's creating a new opportunity, but it's creating a new issue. So will everybody be, be ethical in AI? I don't think so. Will everybody be reasonable and responsible in AI? I don't think so. So all these things are gonna change. You will need regulations, which you talked about earlier at one point, but you will also need how to make these good and helpful for people and society in general. So what we're talking about is blockchain because of the immutable proof of records it's able to host. We will be able to leverage blockchain to audit records. And I think a lot of companies are building in that area. Miko would love to hear your thoughts on yes, it. Yes, so I think this, right, which is that it isn't possible to declare that anything as a function, you put it on the blockchain and it magically is true, right? So I think Manmeet said a beautiful thing, which is he said that if it's a lie, then it will stay there forever. Right. And if it's true, it will stay there forever. And that's actually great. And I think, Sonia, you said something very nice, which is the word audit. Right. So if you post a lie forever into the blockchain, people can find you. Right. They can say, like, look at what you did at this time. Right. Because it's because it, the record is permanent. Right. So that's a very beautiful quality. Right. And it's a record that's permanent and it's on the Internet. So it's in front of everyone. So to me, the thing that's so interesting is, is that, you know, Manmeet was saying that ethical use is so important because AI makes it very easy to lie, right? You can make a fake video of a politician doing fake things. You can make them look as evil as you like. And, you know, then all the people will be voting against that person, right? Because they did the evil thing, you know, that they saw with their own eyes, right? So it's, a, it's, it's very, very easy to create now a fake reality. So this we launched this talking about the Apple virtual reality, augmented reality, right? And But there's going to be just full fake reality like nobody's going to know who to believe what to believe you know and what the answer is going to be using cryptography and using kind of signing and using this base layer technology where there's mathematically no way that it couldn't have been this person you know and then there's mathematically like they're making a statement that's permanently in a public record you know and eventually you can make them accountable like if you know, oh, yeah. so that's important accountability as he mentioned would be wonderful with blockchain and a marriage of AI, the accountability, if you are telling the lie, truth, each person will have an individual rating. Right now, like you have a FICO score, there will be a scoring. It'll be very difficult to lie 300 times and say you are a truthful person because the whole world will know about you. If you keep lying again and again, you're giving wrong information again and again, all those would be recorded somewhere, 
with all the chains which are public chains. So those problems which he mentioned are very, very important. You know, that brings us to an interesting topic here because we are talking about accountability. By nature, blockchain is also built to be a trustless system and for years people have enjoyed anonymity in blockchain. So how do you handle accountability with anonymity or do you see that changing? So anonymity and accountability go hand in hand. You're anonymous, but you're not anonymous from an angle. It's not, maybe we don't know it's Sonia, but we know it is somebody who's posting and at some point we will know it's Sonia. Like you cannot be anonymous from a blockchain for a very, very long time. You could be anonymous to certain times, but then there are videos, recordings and all that happening. You go by 7-Eleven, you make a transaction, it'll go into the same chain or same credit card, we would know it is you. So all those anonymity will be there, it'll, 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 it'll be fixed is the accountability that will become more important there. And that's where all the marriages which are happening, these AIs and Web3s and artificial intelligence. See, there was a hype cycle, and everybody talked about Metaverse just two years back. People just stopped talking about Metaverse when crypto came into picture or when uh, blockchain came into picture, and now people are talking AI in the hype cycle. So, but AI is expensive, it's not cheap. The GPOs are expensive. So slowly people will say, but there is a, there is a new thing happening. There are waves. There is a new thing happening underneath. Web 2.0 will change. I think it may change forever. Mikko, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Anonymity and accountability. How do you think we'll achieve a balance of the two? And just to add to what Manmeet said, right? Like earlier, probably in 2013, 2014, cryptocurrencies, it was easy to launder money through that. But just recently, a couple of months back, somebody who had stolen like 10,000 or a few million dollars in Bitcoin, mm. that person was actually caught. And we have companies yes. like Chainalysis constantly yes. monitoring the chain. And the mistake this person did was mixing the legitimate currency he bought from an exchange, a central exchange <laughs> where the person was verified, mixing that with this illegi illegitimate currencies. And that's how it was caught. And now people are saying that, hey, it is going to be extremely hard to remain anonymous on blockchain and move money around, especially because of all of these new um, monitoring systems that we have in place. We are talking about blockchain security. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that, so Michael. I think this, right, which is the internet and freedom itself is really about choices and people giving choices, right? So I think there may be a power that really enables people to remain anonymous if they choose so, right? But I believe what should happen is that people should be learning how to be careful on the internet. So for example, I stopped in a cafe and someone looked at my shirt, it said Gumi Crypto, and they said, oh, do you, are you do, do you do crypto? And I said, yes. And then, so the, it was a barista at the cafe and they said, well, what is it? Like, what is crypto, right? And so my first comment was, was well, Someone may say to you that crypto is a scam. So they may say it's a scam, right? And they will be 90% right, which is that 90% of any, if you just pick a random crypto and say, oh, is that a safe thing? Is that a wonderful thing? 90% of anything will be bad, right? It will be some crazy fraud, right? But to me, the 10% that's actually not a scam is actually world changing technology, right? It's incredibly, powerful, virtuous, and valuable technology. And I think what needs to happen is that people need to learn how to trust, right? So for example, if there is an anonymous creator, so for example, Bitcoin has an anonymous, anonymous creator, but by now there's so many people who have studied Bitcoin that they feel comfortable. So now people are doing it, right? But there's other one like Ethereum, which has a founder that's not anonymous, right? And now it's like, well, if that's bad, then we'll definitely catch the guy, right? Because everybody knows who it is, right? So I feel like we have to learn how to make decisions about how to trust and who to trust, I think is important. Yeah, and this also person to person, that's where finding the right entrepreneur, finding the right person. See at seed, pre-seed stage, we look for an entrepreneur. Then when you go to Series A and higher stages, then you look at the company, how it's doing. So different level, different places. So it depends on us, not on us. It is a big weight on early stage VCs like Maiko and others in the market. And I'm just learning this in because of my one year. Uh, there's a big, big, big weight on these guys that they pick the right people. 
because they are the ones who are going to be feeders into bigger companies. They are the ones who are going to be fed into Series A, Series B, and they, the partnerships will look into that. Are these entrepreneurs the great ones? Are they right ones? So it's a big pressure on these guys. It's great that we are, you started talking about entrepreneurs because one of the questions I had in mind for both of you actually was what are the qualities you look for in the founding team, the entrepreneurs that you are investing in, especially as early stage VCs? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, for me, one of the insane points is really passion, right? So our slogan at Gumi Cryptos is your passion, our conviction. Right. So it's a, in a way, it's a way for us to connect with these passionate people. Right. Because so one of the amazing things you'll. So I always ask, why? Why are you doing? Why are you building this thing? Right. And the worst answer that I really don't like is if they say something like it's a great opportunity. Right. Like that's just an opportunist. Right. It's like if it's an opportunity, then you're an opportunist. Right. So my point is, is that entrepreneurship gets very hard. Right. Uh, so when it gets hard, then some other opportunity will look like a better opportunity. Right. And so if you're competing against every other opportunity in the world, then maybe running your dad's chain of sandwich shops is a better opportunity. And you just go ahead and go do that. Right. And how does your thing compete with that? Right. Whereas if you have a true passion, for example, a person who has felt a problem in the world and they have a burning desire to make it the problem solved for all the people, right? That That's a beautiful motivation. That's someone who's like, I felt the pain. I, I can't stand the idea of someone going through the same thing as me. Like, I'm going to fix this no matter what. That's a beautiful yeah. entrepreneur. That's a great entrepreneur. That's someone who will yeah. stick to it. Perfect. Uh, passion is the most important part, which we also look at. But we also want them to understand, have the knowledge, the deep scale knowledge of that particular model, business, or understanding, and then complementary team, and able to hire a team. And the fourth one, which I look at out of these, after these three, which is more important, they should be ready to iterate and adapt. Because things keep changing over time, like Web3 was a big thing, but now the everything is coming to a like intersection point where you have to use Web3, you have to use AI, you have to use blockchain, you have to use so many things. If the entrepreneur is not ready to adapt and change and he sticks to his own guns and says, what I am solving is the best and doesn't understand or doesn't move or doesn't change or is not coachable by the VCs or early stage VCs. But when the product is ready, you are at that stage. Yeah, it's very difficult to iterate and change. But early on, you should be ready. And that's what we look at these four or five qualities in that people. All right. So, folks, again, you know, if you are entrepreneurs and you're approaching any VCs, you need to learn from these amazing gentlemen here who just spoke about how what they look for in entrepreneurs that they're investing in, right? The passion that needs to reflect. You should also be coachable because your early iterations are the moments where you need to pivot, pivot, pivot until you find the right idea or rather the right execution strategy for the problem that you're trying to solve, right? And the problem that you're trying to solve, the passion you have for it, that has to shine through. Because as Miko beautifully said here, if you are just running behind opportunities, you're just an opportunist. You are not necessarily an entrepreneur who is trying to solve problems and has a passion for solving problems. Now, with that being said, Miko, you invested in OpenSea early on. I want to ask you, and again, for the benefit of our audience, right? Many of them might have heard about OpenSea, but many of them might not know about OpenSea. Maybe you could start by talking about NFTs, the way you saw it when you made an investment in OpenSea, and then just talk about what made you invest in OpenSea and what's that investment looking like right now? Absolutely. So, you know, really, OpenSea is just a one stop shop for this digital asset called NFT or non-fungible token, right? It's a very techy, nerdy name, but what it means is it means a digitally permanent object that just lives on the internet itself instead of living in some database, right? Because the thing that happens if it lives in a database is that like you can make a copy, right? So the idea of NFT is if it lives on the internet, then you just can't make a copy of it. It's just the original, right? So you have one copy 
and it lives, you know, and then people can buy and sell, right? So really it's like an eBay for all NFTs, right? So like to me, you know, what we got excited about is we really got excited about the idea that this is the base layer of the metaverse, right? Which is that the thing, so I'm, I'm reading a, a exciting book called Virtual Society by Herman Narula. And he describes kind of this idea that virtual societies have been created ever since the pyramids or ever since the dawn of human history, people have been making stories, right? And they've been creating virtual worlds in their imagination, right? But now we have the ability to create virtual worlds that appear like magic in front of our eyes inside of a Apple Vision Pro headset or inside of like the Quest 3 in the Facebook meta universe, right? So like the idea that we can manifest these visions in front of our eyes really gives a lot of promise. But the question then becomes like, what about things like ownership? What about things like currencies and money? What about things, also things that we all believe in that are kind of these collective virtual hallucinations, but like in a sense, like what about these digitally permanent assets and how do, where do they live and how do they live? So, you know, I think the base layer of the metaverse is really ownership and belonging, right? And those are really the exciting pieces that kind of give us reasons to go. Because I think the reasons, people haven't reasoned well about the reasons for the metaverse, right? So I think the first versions of the metaverse have been very boring because people go there and they're like, what do I do? And then they're like, oh, I look cool. And then, you know, a week later they're like, okay, I'm done. Yes, we are yet to get to that immersive one metaverse experience that that uh, Neil Stephenson actually painted for us, right? We are yet to get there, and we are also restricted by the by the limitations of the hardware that we are on today to create those immersive experiences. We need gigabits of internet, and we also yeah. need very good hardware that could allow us to get into a seamless streaming mode. So there are those challenges. But what I loved is that term that you used, Miko, when we were talking about NFTs, that you actually started talking about digital assets, right? Uh, Manmeet, I'm going to go to you before coming back to Miko to talk about open. No, no, I, I just wanted to add a point here. I invested in a company personally. This was before the fund. The company was called All Seated. It was basically hybrid. Marriages were hybrid. The events were hybrid, everything. So they were creating the whole environment. They were creating the hotels in the metaverse. So you could virtually attend a marriage and you can personally be on the table of that people. So they, they split, I think, now into two companies or they've grown into a different thing. But there are other companies who are doing this. So it was early stages. But now what Miko is saying on with Apple, what's happening, it's, it's going to be a very different experience. I think they all will have to adapt and change to this new environment now. Manmeet, before we again talk about OpenSea, I want to ask you, when it comes to digital assets, and we spoke about ownership, right? As Miko beautifully said, it's all about ownership. And even when we go back into our past and we look at how many artists, or even when it comes to patents and stuff, you know, people, there have been issues of people stealing from others, right? Now, that being said, so when it comes to digital assets, how do you look at it? How do you look at NFTs and this entire cryptography and the technology provided by Web3 to help establish ownership of digital assets? See, NFTs were great. They are still great because they gave a unique identification, as you mentioned, and they brought in in front of the people and they were, they were able to sell it. Artists were the best and the most uh, benefiting of that one because they could make their art and sell it directly without going to the intermediary. They could make an NFT, put it around it, and it'll be single one piece of that, and they could sell it. And that's where you saw the hype cycle, where the NFTs were selling for millions and millions of dollars. Yes, it came in a little bit, but now at some point it'll get stabilized and you will see. But that was the only way that was making it unique. That was making it uh, a numbered way, a digital way to tell you that this is the unique one, this is yours, or this is his. So those things were very important. And I, I, I don't think this is going to go away. I don't think any of these are going to go away with this Web3 blockchain marriage and all the AI stuff coming in. And now with ChatGPT, you can generate so many images. You can, with prompt engineering, you can bring in five images together and generate a new image. But your unique image will still stay unique, and you can make your NFTs. There were so many companies who were helping make image to an NFT. We saw that, and we all are seeing that. 
Mikkel, what are your thoughts? You know, as an early investor in OpenSea, which is the market leader even today when it comes to trading these digital assets or NFTs, how do you see NFTs evolving in the next five to ten years? And even before that, right? Before you actually address that question, help our our audience, right, of the Silicon Dreams and Radio Zindagi, fifteen fifty AM, understand what made you invest in OpenSea. Yeah. So the thing that is fascinating is that we really got involved through gaming, right? Which is fascinating. And to me, when I think about gaming, gaming and the metaverse are deeply interconnected. So, for example, if you study Satya Nadella at Microsoft, they're buying Activision Blizzard. They created a headset called Hololens, but they're actually their metaverse is a game. They're thinking about games, right? And to me, when I was, I got the good fortune to speak with uh, Neil Stevenson, the author of Snow Crash, inventor of the word metaverse. So I asked him, I said, Neil, how are you thinking about the metaverse these days, right? And he's working on a project called Lamina One, which is sort of a layer one blockchain for the metaverse. But he said that the metaverse has to be fun, right? Which I really just, that's a beautiful thing. So how did we get involved in OpenSea, right? We actually, um, my partner in Japan created a game called My Crypto Heroes. He became the publisher of a game. Actually, his other entrepreneurs made the game. But the idea was, was that we discovered through them that the best and only place to sell NFTs of any kind is OpenSea, right? So we found OpenSea through this game you know, the game was like a moderate success. It was a good game, but like it wasn't a huge success. But really, in a way, we used this game as a way of getting into OpenSea, right? So for us, our lens around this is gaming. And to me, the thing that's really exciting is that gaming is, enter is entertainment. And, and, and as entertainment, it's kind of AI resistant. Meaning, and I think that Microsoft is thinking beautifully about AI because they're the deepest investor in open AI, right? So like when Microsoft says gaming is coming, I mean, you can be scared and think, oh, AI is going to take people's jobs. But what's going to happen is that there's going to be more entertainment and people will spend more of their time in entertainment, a lot of digital entertainment, including gaming, right? And so in a sense, this is going to be I choose to be uh, looking forward into a brighter future. So, you know, I think the future is unwritten, right? So because it's unwritten, we can choose to either be optimistic and enthusiastic about something that hasn't happened, or we can be terrified and we can just spend our whole day or sleepless nights, right? So, you know, it's better to just be, look into the future, dream a little, you know, read some science fiction, like try to enjoy this future because it hasn't been written yet. No, uh, perfect. What he said is perfect because it is going to grow. Yes, there will be certain percentage of jobs which will go away, but think about it. How many other jobs are going to be created? How much new assistant help you will have without uh, creating your own stuff or without understanding this whole problem? So it, it's going to be completely revolutionary. And that's what I think. Like it started. It started with Web3. It started with decentralization. Many, many internet. There was one internet. Now there are many, many like uh, chains, like level one chains that you talked about. And, and more than one. More than one is going to survive. It's not going to be only Ethereum. Or it's not going to be only Bitcoin. Or it's not going to be something one. Per, it'll be many chains. And gaming will become one answer. Today, everything has to use internet. Now everything will be different. Gaming will have its own metaverse or own internet. Financial will have its own gaming or own network or own internet. Something else will healthcare will have. So healthcare was not touched in Web 2.0. Now healthcare will be really revolutionized with Web 3.0 and this AI and all that. So, you know, it's great we're talking about the other use cases of Web 3.0, right? One of the things I wanted to, first of all, with to Miko and to Manmeet's points about the metaverse. I feel like it is important. Miko, you said some few keywords there, like dreaming, right? I feel like metaverse is the place where your dreams can come true. That is how our future metaverse vision could be like, right? You dream about something and you can actually manifest in the metaverse, which is not possible to do in real life. If I want to escape to a fantasy land, I cannot do it in my real life. In the metaverse, I can. I'm so excited to hear you say this. And the reason I'm so excited is, is that I think things that are imaginary get a bad rap 
And I'll tell you this, right? Which is that you say, oh, I have an imaginary friend, right? And everybody's laughing at you. And they're like, oh, is this friend in the room with us right now? You know, like there's very kind of people are like, oh, it's imaginary, right? The iPhone was imaginary to Steve Jobs, right? So like everything you can see that you value in your life at some point was imaginary. Even your friends, right? Like your their parents like thought up this person and said like, let's make a person, right? So everything yeah. meaningful is at some point in time imaginary, right? And so to me, the idea of AI plus something like virtual reality, we can make the imaginary things, which are the future, like come to life in front of our eyes, which I think is like very quickly and very powerfully, right? It's because the Absolutely. AIs can generate in three dimensions kind of many things that we can just try to express, even just in language. We can just say, oh, I'd like, a, I'd like to see a fox with nine tails and then AI can do all the hard work of making it visible. Everyone can share your dream now. Everyone can see in front of their eyes. They can see whatever it was. That you can explain your dream. dreams better now. It's amazing. <laughs> and yeah. so it means that the future will arrive faster. Right? I also think it's going to help us cement our understanding about the past too. I remember seeing this ad by Intel, I believe it was, where the class is taking a field trip to the time where mammoths walked on the surface of earth and Amazing. the kids are able to touch the mammoth and we are working on sensory devices for the virtual reality space and it just felt such a surreal learning experience as human beings we learn with multiple senses right and i feel like with the vr world you could actually create even better learning experiences. I feel that our traditional world, we talk about kids with, with uh, dyslexia, for example, right? Now, for them, reading is a problem. But when they are learning things visually, they have audio feed teaching them. I feel like that immersive experience will help right. us create a more equitable learning environment so, for so everyone. You, what you are saying is perfect. We came across a company which was trying to solve a healthcare problem where they were going to have kind of a metaverse where doctor would be in the metaverse, but it was not just doctor in the metaverse. They will have a hand or feeling, they will wear a glove, and the other side also will have Amazing. a glove, and they can put it on the hand, and these guys can get the same feeling. So they were working on something like that, but, but the power, the GPU power, and all that needed on the both sides was difficult, but they were going to create it. They can take your heartbeat. The stethoscope could be put on a heart over here, and it'll be over there and you, the doctor will get a real stethoscope. Yes. So those things are going to be revolutionary. They are going to change. Yes, there are going to be so many middle things in between, so many things need to be done. But yes, that's a real enterprise solution, not just consumer. Consumer solution, it is consumer as well as business solution. I think, Manmeet, you spoke about something extremely important here, right? Like the challenges of today are opportunities of tomorrow. Right. And one of the things we have consistently seen is as we progress, things become more accessible, more affordable, and technology brings it to everyone. Like today, we have more computational power on our phones than what we had on the first supercomputer that was built out, that occupied like an entire warehouse that was used to send rocket ships into outer space, right? And today we are at a conjunction where each one of us has more operating power in just the palm of our hands to actually launch a satellite into space. Uh, with that being said, we spoke about healthcare, Manmeet. You know, on blockchain, obviously, there is a concern with security because, uh, because health chain requires a lot of privacy. For the benefit of the listeners of the Silicon Dreams on Radio Zindagi 1550 AM, would you please touch upon what kind of progress is being made in the Web3 world with zero knowledge proof and some of these new tech to help build a layer of privacy on top of something that so far has been public and transparent? With all these new augmentation and new things happening, privacy is not going to go away. They, there will be regulation. Government will come with a heavy hand on certain things. But privacy will be very important. Yes, gamers will have their privacy. Healthcare will have different level of privacy. Uh, identification, there are so many companies who are building KYC. Identification on, on, on this zero trust is becoming very important. 
all these things are becoming and all these things are being built. Yes, my focus in last 14 years was on privacy, security, and compliance. And I see this becoming even more important with Web3. When it's decentralized, now it's one person's privacy is even more important than when the bunch of credit cards were stolen from American Express or some other credit card companies. But now it's more important. So the importance of privacy is going to be there with AI, with Web3 and all that. And there are so many companies which are coming in. But yes, is it right now? I think the concern is probably three to five years away. But it is there. Right now it's more innovation, more new stuff being created using these Web3s and OpenSeas and all that other stuff. That was, I think his OpenSea investment was a great one. I, I enjoy oh, it. I missed that one. I should have gone on that one because we were not in business at that point. But yeah. All these things would need privacy. Who's uploading, who's buying, who's selling. All that information today is anonymous. So all that will come into picture. Mecca, you know, we spoke about the government coming in. In U.S., generally, because of the free economic structure we have, what normally happens is people are able to innovate freely. And when that industry grows, that's when regulation comes in. Compare that to countries like China or India, where the regulations come in first, then comes the innovation. Things are changing in India now, but generally the free economy and the power for people to build and innovate. We saw that taking off even for the gig economy, right? The gig economy started for years, it thrived, and then regulations came in that, hey, you have to get insurance for your gig economy workers. You have to get them workers comp. And we are seeing the same thing with web three in a heavy handed fashion from the government. So the one topic I want to touch on with both of you is what's happening with the current regulatory landscape and what advice are you giving to founders building to builders building in the web3 space at this moment in time yeah so uh, you know for us as we advise founders right we really do advise them to be compliant and to be safe right but not to kind of get too crazy right because the bottom line is is that there is a tension between innovation and regulation, right? The thing that I think is really ultimately the end game for all of these things, right, is that things will just move to where they are wanted, right? So in a sense, if the US decides to crack down on blockchain or cryptocurrency, then they're just going to go to other countries, right? So, you know, to me, there isn't a monolithic way to eliminate any of these things, right? Because innovation is always ahead of regulation. Innovation is faster, innovation is smarter, innovation is just decentralized, it's in every country, right? So to me, like, there isn't a way to really stop something like open source software like it just can't people will just freely give of their intellectual capabilities and they'll contribute it to the internet as a whole right and obviously like we need to be smart about this but you know i would say you know ultimately that's where this is going to land is that innovation is just going to continue because you know it, it shouldn't be stopped and it can't be stopped now obviously like you know i'm not a libertarian or I'm not an anarchist. So like, you know, obviously there are certain regulations that are, are wanted, right? So we want to keep no, people safe. Exactly. Innovation is great. Innovation is always going to be there and innovation is important till it becomes to the point where it starts misusing or misguiding people. That's when these guardrails, regulation should be looked upon or should be used as a guardrail. They should be there to help, not to stop innovation. But the problem is when governments come down with these regulations, they try to stop innovation. And that's when Miko mentioned, people leave the country. It, it should come as a guardrail, it should help come in to support so that innovation keeps growing and innovation keeps happening. Com people do comply, there are some bad actors who don't, but generally if there is a regulation, 99% or at least 90% of the organization do comply to that. And I have never seen, I've seen, I've worked with largest to the large organization and smallest to the small ones. The large ones never ever fail to comply with the regulation. So regulations should be used as a guardrail. Government should be careful about it, not to stop innovation because crypto, Web3 and all that, blockchain, they are important. They are important, integral part of our society today. Yes, it's in small number and it'll grow in number. They should not be thrown out of the country. We should figure out, use them as a guardrail. And that's the most important thing. I think both of you said some tremendously important points, right? Because I personally feel, and I'm, 
allowed to share my opinion, but my personal opinion is that the current regulatory bodies are actually doing disservice to a trillion dollar industry. A lot of the successful entrepreneurs from the Web3 space who set up businesses in the 2013, 2015, 2016 boom, unfortunately have moved their headquarters to other more crypto friendly jurisdictions like Dubai or even Hong Kong. And a lot of them have created offshore entities where majority of their business takes place. And we have also seen companies like Binance, for example, exit Canada because of the problems of overly regulating something that needs to uh, needs to grow. We are talking about a trillion dollars plus industry here, right? So as regulations shape, for any of the regulators maybe listening in, right? As VCs in the space who are bullish on Web3 and who understand how Web3 is not just about, hey, let's go and launch a coin and become a millionaire tomorrow, right? It's about solving real world problems. How do you think should the regulatory bodies today be responding to Web3? What are the things that you think should be regulated perhaps? And how overarching should that regulation really be? And also, if you have any interactions with any regulators, what do you see coming in next for Web3 in terms of regulations? I'd love to start with Miko. I mean, there's some absolutely wonderful people, incredibly intelligent people working in regulation as public servants. You know, so I'm thinking about Hester Peirce from the SEC. She's a commissioner and she's just very intelligent, well-informed, has great policies and great ideas. So, you know, I think it is a human endeavor. I think from my perspective, it's very much about safety and guardrails, you know, so I think really like one of the hallmarks of this is really in Japan, which is Japan actually is the largest global economy with both the highest amount of regulatory clarity, but is also fairly highly regulated around the topic of crypto. So it's very regulated. Recently, FTX crashed. And Japan was the only country where all the exchange customers were 100% uh, made whole. They got all their money back because Japan had already created a regulation to separate the custody of the asset from the exchange, right? So this very wise regulation protected those people, right? So in a sense, like, there is a bit of a heavy hand, but it's absolutely man meets guardrails. So those people were protected. And now Japan is actually moving forward quickly because they've realized that their regulations are actually quite good now. And so, so people have clarity. It's a little heavy handed, but it's also very protective. So I think that's a beautiful combination. They have a good playbook in place at the moment that other countries should probably look at unless we become like Europe, right? Where recently Chad GPT was completely banned in Italy. <laughs> wow. And it feels like the governments, they come to a standstill what they do is if they don't understand something, they try to just stop it right there in its track. And some of the people also say that regulations are probably advancing too slowly for the rate at which Web3 and AI is innovating. But that's always going to be the case. But what Miko mentioned, I was not aware of. But if Japan, everything was whole and FTX failed all over the place and people lost so much money, that's great. That's a great example of positive regulation. And I think that's the way everybody should look at it like regulation even the regulators here the problem is regulators don't get the best brains they are busy doing innovation and that's the problem they should give more money and hire the right people in that side and they should be better regulators they do get one or two top lies who are great and second third level who are great but in general they don't get that many teams either the money is not there and that's the reason it's important that regulators help innovation and what Miko said on innovation side to put a guardrail like this is like I think from compliance perspective like people do comply but if they are not in your st regulation area if they leave the country how are they gonna comply so you have to keep them here you have to make them comply and you have to regulate them yeah. and you have to do a positive regulation on that and you don't want a brain dump right you, you don't want consumers losing money you don't want consumers losing their assets you don't want older people leave you losing their retirement money that will happen if they are operating from outside the country. So, it's very difficult to control that. But ultimately, everyone has to be safe for themselves, right? Like yes. I was talking with a young man, and this young man was maybe in his early 20s. He was like, 
I give up on the banking system. I hate banks. I'm only going to do crypto, right? And when I heard this, I was a little fearful because I was like, oh, are you playing safe? Or like, where, where are you? What are you doing? Like, are you putting these things, right? And he basically said this. He basically said, look, I know that I'm jumping into ice cold waters and I know that there's sharks swimming in these waters, but I can tell you I'm jumping off of the Titanic, right? So he's basically like, I know how bad it is. Right. So after he started talking this way, I was like, OK, I feel OK. I, like he knows it's not safe. Right. He knows he has to protect so himself. That, that, that's right? a smart so this, consumer. It's uh, correct. Correct. So this person I'm not afraid for. I'm afraid for someone who's kind of maybe they they listen to a radio show and then they run out and put all their money into some crazy crypto project. That's a scam. Right. Like that's terrible. So mm-hmm. please, please protect yourself. Be careful. And, and there know, will be and, self-regulation and, and be also. See, there will be self-regulation. There will be market regulation also. Like VCs and others and angels will stop investing in those kind of companies and they won't grow. The problem is when we started investing in anything, when there is a hype cycle, you invest in 90 good things but 10 bad things or bad apples or bad things also happen. So over time, we also learn. It's not that we have stopped learning. We learn, we meet entrepreneurs on a daily basis. We see, I, I personally see about 15 to 20 companies sometimes in a week. Sometimes I see four to five. But these many companies, you get to judge people differently. And the, we also have to regulate and they themselves have to self-regulate. I think this is an excellent point. We talk, when we are with our Web3 community, I am normally talking about how a lot of the times, I feel like 90% or more of human beings feel safe when somebody else takes responsibility of their safety. Yes. Right. So, you know, if you have put your money into a bank and the bank account is FDIC insured, you feel safer about it. Whereas when you jump into Web3, the cold waters, the ice cold waters that we're talking about, here comes great power because you own every penny. You can see where everything is going. You are your own bank. But with great power comes great responsibility, right? And and as you guys both said, that consumers, for the consumers, for them to be more savvy, that is important. Do you think that actually creates a barrier to mass adoption in Web3? Because last year when we saw there were just 87 million active wallets for Web3, and we have 8 billion people on the face of planet Earth. So I think you're describing this foundational boundary within crypto, which is this idea of self custody, which means that I'm fully controlling my own assets using cryptography, right? So it's sort of like, wow, that seems pretty heavy, right? That's a heavy load for people to bear, right? So I think it isn't necessary for every person in the world to have their own self custody. I think that's an option for certain people who prefer, right? I think the thing that is really important is the creation and development of trusted patterns of custody, right? Whether these patterns are using complex multi-party computation or whether they're using, you know, all kinds of novel technology that kind of combines Uh, security with decentralization with ease of use right so we're going to develop models that I think are both safe and that are not complicated crazy or dangerous right that that users will enjoy so I I really think that these are technological and they're solvable you know we're definitely have some wonderful companies working there's always going to be a small community which will love the self custody they will but self custody is not for all did everybody keep money under the mattress when banks were crashing well, not everybody mm-hmm. did. Not Self-custody everybody. is like keeping your money in the mattress because there is less protection there. Well, there is protection, but you don't know who can hack into your stuff and who are you holding responsible now. It's self-custody. I own my coins and somebody steals them. Who am I going to go cry to? But if you keep it in <laughs> Coinbase or some other big thing, if it gets stolen from there, there is regulation which says, that, okay, they will fill you up. So there is some protection there, if not a huge protection in this whole thing. And that's where there is a fight between this innovation and regulation happening. So those, those things are important, and those things are going to be there, and they're going to keep going. All right. So now we are approaching the end of our segment. And before we wrap up, I would love to go to each one of you and just ask you to describe what is it or what are the trends that you're investing in right now, right, as 
Gummy Crypto or as Punjab VC, what kind of investments are you looking to make this year or next year? And also just leave a parting message for our audience members over here. So I'll go to you first, Miko. We, you have a minute and then we'll go to Manmeet because we just have two minutes before we wrap up this. Yeah, so I'm very, very excited about this idea of mass adoption that you mentioned, Sonia. So like to us, we feel like the killer applications within the blockchain area are in either financial services or they're in gaming. So we feel like those are the two really richest areas. We do think that there's a number of different applications that come later, but we really feel like those two areas are the areas that will be the most hot. And so that's for us, you know, a source of great excitement and enthusiasm. So, you know, we think that, uh, you know, there's great applications and great mass adoption coming. So we are looking from an angle which is solving the enterprise problem. They are the laggards. They are the last ones to jump in, but they are already jumping in now. Pretty much every large organization has created either a Web3 team or an AI team or something, and they need solution. They need easy solution, support, healthcare, finance, logistics. All these are important topics. So we look at entrepreneurs, we look at companies who are trying to solve the real problems. Yes, gaming and early finance, DEX and all that are real problems. They, a lot of people have tried to solve it, but these are the ones which were left behind. But the money, generally, I personally feel a lot of money is in the enterprise and they are the ones, when you get a solution for them, the money comes to the companies and they're gonna grow. And my focus is more on using Web3 AI and blockchain to solve enterprise problems. A little different focus than Miko. Well, that's great, right? Because we had two different VCs with different investment TCs coming together. Again, guys, today in the studio, we had Miko from Gumi Crypto and we had Manmeet from Punja VC. Go ahead, look at their websites look at their portfolios both of them have done some great work in early stage uh, venture capital investment and with that this is your show host sonia huja i am the founder and ceo of orbis 86 where we are onboarding people to web3 through arts education entertainment and we are using ai to augment these learning experiences with that I want to say a goodbye to our lovely audiences listening into the Silicon Dreams on 1550 AM. Cheers, guys.